Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Monday Night Calculus. Our usual moderator, Curtis Brown, is on a leave of absence tonight, but we still have Allison in the background moderating the chat, and we'll be asking questions and looking for your questions as usual. Tonight's topic is one of our favorites, the fundamental theorem of calculus, perhaps the most important idea concept in the entire course. Hope you've had an opportunity to take a look at some of the problems for this evening. And we're gonna start out a little bit with technology tonight. So Tom is gonna to start out with some TI-84 stuff. Is that right, Tom? That's correct. All right, Tom's gonna to start out with some introductory technology information, and then we'll come back and start to look at some of the problems. So Tom, all okay. yours. Okay, great. Let me uh, share my screen, and hopefully we're coming up with- uh... Looks good. Okay, so we can see the TI-84. Um, and um, I was chatting with Steve prior to us going on air here, uh, reminiscing that uh, this is, uh, it's been almost exactly 50 years since the, each of us took our first calculus course. How about that? And the reason I bring that up, other than to embarrass ourselves with how old <laughs> we are, it, <laughs> uh, for, for many years, I think calculus students, when they thought of the fundamental theorem of calculus, when they encountered it, uh, I think many students came away with thinking about, okay, that's is this great theorem that gives you a shortcut for how to calculate a definite interval. So you don't have to do Riemann sums. You just have to find a NI derivative, plug in the two endpoints of your integral, take the difference, here's your answer. And how cool is that? But it turns out that, that that's the second fundamental theorem of calculus, and it's really just a corollary to a much more important idea, and that's fundamental theorem calculus number one. And for a lot of students, they brush it aside because it, it involves this crazy looking function that's a definite integral function with a variable in it and what in the world's going on there. And so I think graphing calculators have really opened up opportunities to really appreciate how important that, that theorem is. So let me, get right to it and go to my y equals menu. And um, I know you can see kind of a complicated y6 down there. That's something we'll look at a little bit later, but I'm just gonna put in a function, very simple one into y1. It's gonna be x uh, squared, okay? And I purposely picked a function that if I was to ask you to Okay, what would be an antiderivative of this function? What would be a function that would have this function as its derivative? And this is one you can kind of guess because it's so simple. You kind of just reverse engineer your derivatives rules and you're thinking about, okay, it's one third of x cubed. That's what that's going to work out to be an antiderivative. And then with some more thought, you might think, well, okay, that's one third x cubed plus some constant. Okay, you could add on any constant and still have function with the same derivative. What the fundamental theorem of calculus is, is for any function, as long as it's continuous, you can manufacture an antiderivative instantaneously. That's crazy, because a continuous function could be really, really ugly looking. This one's pretty simple, but the technique's always going to be the same. Here's the recipe. So in Y2, I'm going to go to the math menu and pull down the FN int. And there I get a definite integral and I'm going to make this thing into a function. I can pick any value I want for a lower limit. I'm going to go ahead and put in zero. And I'm going to make my upper limit the variable X. And then for my integrand, I'm going to make y1 be the integrand, which happens to be x squared. So when we put in function y1, there we go. And this is maybe is not the best of form, but this, the variable of integration, we sometimes call it a dummy variable. I'm gonna use x again here, uh, but really x is our variable and it's independent variable and it's that upper limit of integration. And my claim is this funny looking definite integral function 
should be an antiderivative for y1, no matter what y1 is. As long as y1 is continuous, this will be an antiderivative. Let's take a look at a graph of both functions. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a zoom decibel window. It's kind of my favorite go-to window. There's the y equal x squared. And now I'm waiting and waiting and hoping that I'll see, oh, here it comes. This is a graph of something that should be an antiderivative of that. And sure enough, let's just do a visual check and see if it makes sense. Now, y equals x squared, its y values are always positive, except it's zero and it's zero. That means an antiderivative, if that's going to be its derivative, if its derivative is always positive, it should always be increasing. Except, well, okay, actually it is increasing everywhere. It does have a zero derivative right at zero. So this is looking visually very good. Now, you might have been looking at this and thinking, wow, why did that take so slow to graph? Well, if we go back to y equals, actually, let me go ahead and turn on a trace. Remember that y2 is an integral. So for every single value that it computed to plot, it was, it was doing basically a Riemann sum kind of thing. So it was doing a lot of computations to manufacture this. So you might think, well, that's an awfully lot of work for something we were just able to guess. But what's so cool about the fundamental theorem is this will work even on functions that you have no hope of guessing the antiderivative for. All right. And if we wanted to graph it a little bit faster, we have a way of doing that. But first of all, you might be wondering, say, well, you put in a zero there. What if you put in something else for the lower limit? Excuse me. Just coughed a little bit there. Okay. So let me show you a couple of things. I'm going to go back to y equals. And I'm going to change the lower limit in y2 to something else. Let's say we changed it to uh, 2. It's a new lower limit of integration. But the fundamental theorem says no matter what you put in for a lower limit there, this should be an antiderivative of your original function, y1. So what would that mean? We already saw one antiderivative, and this is surely a different function. How could it have the same derivative? Well, let's graph it and see what happens. Okay, there's our y equal x squared again. Mm -hmm. And now we should get a new function, but it's supposed to have the same derivative. Should come on board here pretty soon. Ah, here it comes. Ah, sure enough, it still has the right characteristics. It's all it's increasing as a positive derivative everywhere. And it has a zero derivative right at x equals zero. And if you think about it, we can see that change in that lower limit of integration was the same as doing a vertical shift. The function. So it's really even gets a different arbitrary constant. Now I want to show a couple of things. This thing was graphing really slowly. So let me go back to y equals. And actually, I'm going to go to the mode and change from math plant classic. So what does that do, Tom? That essentially writes things out horizontally rather than giving you any of the pretty print? Uh, yes. And in fact, we saw an example of it when we were in the, the uh, trace. It showed mm -hmm. that F and int notation. Gotcha. When mm -hmm. I go back to Y equals, I'm going to see instead of that nice integral notation, I see this F and int thing. So it's written out literally. And so you can see, OK, the way it's listed is you f n in you can put in your function, the variable of integration, and then the limits of integration, which was from gotcha. 2 to x. Okay. Now, the, the advantage of this notation is we can add 
a fourth argument to it, excuse me, a fifth argument. So besides the function, variable, limits of integration, we could add, add comma, a precision value. Now, since I'm graphing in a zoom decimal window, each pixel is just worth 0.1 in each direction. So 0 0.1 should be close enough. That won't be a real accurate value for a function evaluation, but it's going to be pretty accurate for giving us a good look at the graph. Okay. And the advantage of it is going to be it's going to graph much faster. Let's take a look and see what happens. I'm wondering if I actually hit enter. Let's see. Did I? Be... Oh, that's still. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh... Hmm, that's that's interesting. I thought it would graph faster than that. So I want to check my y equals real fast here. So let's go to y equals and see if did I actually get the 0 0.1 in there? Yeah, I see it. And is it closed off with a parenthesis? All right. Let's see. Ooh, okay. Well, yeah, I expected to, act, to actually to have graphed a little faster than that, but that's interesting. But let's see, just for, uh, let me try 0 0.2. Okay. Let's see if that graphs a little faster. Okay, well, I'm I'm not too mm. impressed with speed, <laughs> <laughs> but it is something tried to get a little bit more speed to it. Okay. Gotcha. Let me show one more example here, Steve, and I'll, I'll sure. be sure. to you. And this is just to get across the power of this. Yep. So I'm going to go back to y equals. And let me replace y1 with another function. Okay. Uh, this one is going to be uh, E uh, to the, actually, let me clear that out, try that again. Okay, so take E to the quantity negative X squared. And you can see I'm still in that classic mode, so it's not writing it as a yep, exactly. uh, what it yep. would look like. Okay. Got it. And let me go ahead and change this to a point 0.1. And let me go ahead and show you what that looks like in classic mode. So I'm going to go to mode. Change back to math grant. And now let's go back to y equals. And now you can see it's back into that notation that looks really nice. Right. Okay. So Tom, when you lose that, when you go back into uh, this math print, have you lost the effect of that precision that you had added in classic mode? Is that gone? Uh, I think it will. You will lose it if you change the limit of integration um, at all. So, so yeah, you have to go to the classic mode to put that in. Yes. And then you can go back to math print mode if you want to see just the definite integral. But, will it uh, but yeah, there's no real way to add that precision in the math print mode. But if you've added it in math print, is it carried over to this presentation? Yes, it, does. it is. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Got it. So if I go back to uh, classic mode again. It, it should be there. Let's take a look. Uh, it may not be because I, I changed the lower limit of integration. Okay. So let me go back to y equals. Uh, you can see that's disappeared. Yep. So I can put in at 0 0.1 again. If I want a little bit faster graphing, 
Mm -hmm. And for the record, earlier there was a comment in the chat that it was twice as fast. Uh, Tony timed it. Oh, that's pretty oh, cool. cool. I did. Okay. So thanks. I'm glad somebody was astute with the stopwatch. <laughs> so here we're graphing. So this e to the negative x squared, uh, this is an incredibly important function in mathematics that underlies a good deal of probability theory. It's kind of the the uh, linchpin of the normal probability curve, you know, modulo a, a little bit of a some constants some constant. in there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we can see that there was, we had no, it's a perfectly nice continuous function. It's just not one you're going to add a differentiate by paper and pencil in any nice closed form. Substitution's not going to work. There's no method of anti-differentiation going to work on that. But we were able to plot an anti-derivative with no problem at all. Let's see, does it make any sense? Well, over here, our function's really close to zero, our original. That means our anti-derivative should be really flat where it climbs up to a value of one, our antiderivative should have a slope of one. And where this flat goes down to zero again, our function should flatten out again. So it has exactly the characteristics we'd hope. And so here's a function we couldn't anti-differentiate with paper and pencil. We're able to graph its antiderivative really nicely. All right, so that's so, some some nice oh. things. I think this is just an incredible functionality, the, the ability to actually graph these definite integral functions. It really brings the fundamental theorem of calculus number one alive. And I, it's really I, my appreciation for what that, that theorem says and what it's doing for us. We can manufacture an antiderivative of any continuous function on demand with just the same, the same formula works in general for all continuous functions. That is an incredible tool, and it's fundamental. So, <laughs> let me, Very cool. so let me stop my share and uh, okay. turn it back to Steve. Okay, thanks, Tom. Cool stuff. All right, how about that? There's the first page of uh, problems and the solutions. Uh, Allison mentioned something about the link to the problems. Uh, there was an issue with that. And I just wanted to remind people that we do publish these problems on the Facebook AP Calculus teachers page also. So if you can't find it on the TI or the YouTube link, it's always on that uh, Facebook group if you're a member of that. So what we try to do tonight with this first problem is give you a very typical sort of a pre-response question with a bazillion different parts here all kinds of things that students might see in a free response question that involves the fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, at least part one anyway. I'm gonna lean a little bit off to the side here, Allison. I might go off the camera a little bit, but I hope you can still see my screen. So we're gonna start out by taking a look at this function f, which is piecewise defined here. I think it's, I've done this correctly, Tom. One, two, three, there's four pieces there, four straight line segments. And it's very typical on the exam to see a function defined in terms of a definite integral, something like that. And we'll see as we progress through this problem, we'll see other functions involving G uh, where we might see a polynomial or a product or something else like that. So the very first thing I'd like to do here is to find the intervals on which G is increasing and find those intervals on which G is decreasing. So the very first thing I need to notice about this is I need to notice that g prime of x is equal to f of x. And the reason that I did that is because, well, if I want to know where g is increasing or decreasing, I'm going to scribble a little bit off to the side. I want to know where g prime of x is greater than 0, and I want to know where g prime of x is less than 0. Well, the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 tells us that g prime is equal to f, given that g is defined like this. And I think Tom and I would both like to encourage the students out there that when you take the exam in May, if you get a problem like this, make sure that you do indeed write down this step. That's often worth a point on a free response question. Uh, that's an important idea, the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, and we really want students to state that. 
So that means I have to find, I have to look at this graph and simply determine, well, where is it F positive and where is it negative? Okay, it's negative over here from minus two to one, it's negative over here from minus two to zero, excuse me, it's negative over here from six to nine, and it's positive in between. So that leads to these intervals of increasing and decreasing. Now you'll also notice that I've included the endpoints in here, and that's a that's a, an idea or a concept for another discussion. On the grading of the exam, we would not take off if a student included or excluded those endpoints, except if there was some sort of contradiction. In other words, if the function were not defined at one of those endpoints and it were included in an interval, they would not earn the point. But I believe that the endpoints should be included, and I believe that because we need to look at a definition of increasing and decreasing, but we won't argue about that this evening. I get this answer by looking at the graph of F. Let's take a look at part B. Find the absolute maximum and minimum value, oh, pardon me, the absolute maximum value of G over this interval minus two to nine. Well, in order to solve this problem, I'm actually going to use the candidates test. And when I finish this problem, when I finish solving this one, remind me, Tom, don't let me miss this. I just want to talk a little bit about solving this in another way or without using the candidates test. Um, this is a continuous function on a closed interval. And so there must be an absolute maximum value on that closed interval. And the way that I approach this is I'm first going to find the critical points. It means I need to find the places where the first derivative g prime is equal to zero. Well, we know that g prime is equal to f, so I'm going to look at the graph and visually determine, well, where is f equal to zero? And that's at x equals zero and x equals six. Now, I didn't include this in here, but I feel obligated to write a little bit about this. Um, to look at all the critical points of G, I really also need to take a look at all those places where G prime of X does not exist. This is sometimes a little tricky for students, but there actually are no places. So I'm just going to write none. There are no places where the first derivative does not exist. Now, that's kind of odd. If I can arrow back up here for a second, if I look at the graph of G prime, there it is, F. There are places on the graph of F where its derivative does not exist. But F is defined everywhere on this interval minus 2 to 9. And so the derivative of G does, in fact, exist everywhere on that interval. Okay, so if I'm using this candidate's test, that means I need to find the value of G at the endpoints, let's see, the endpoints were minus two and nine, and at the critical points, zero and six. Well, this one's easy. That's the definite integral from zero to zero of f of t dt. And how do we evaluate, how do we find this integral? How do we evaluate g to these other values? Well, they are primarily area arguments. And so I'll just take a quick look at one of these. If I want to find g of minus 2, by definition, that is the definite integral from 0 to minus 2 of f of t dt. And the way that I like to do these, I like to work left to right. So I'm going to use the property of definite integrals. And I'm going to flip the bounds and put a minus sign out in front. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here and I'm going to try to find this area bounded by the x-axis and the graph. Well, let's see. I have to think about this for a minute. I'm going to find that area, but it is below the x-axis, so I need to attach a minus sign to it. And without going through this in gory detail, there are lots of different ways that one could do this. For example, there is a square in there of area 1. There is a triangle right there. And there's another triangle right there. And I think you can see that here. That's how I actually did it. There's a square there of area one, but it's got a minus sign attached to it because it's below the x-axis. Here's that remaining triangle right here. There's a minus sign attached to it. It's below the x-axis. And there's one more triangle in there. 
And I think when I did all of that and accounted for all the minus signs, I got a five halves. So, okay, I went through all of that for the endpoints and for the critical points. And when I did all of that, I think I found the maximum value of G was 21 over two. And that's a solution to my question. Where's the, what is the absolute maximum value of G on that interval? Now, one comment about this. Um, I think that the easiest way to solve these problems on an exam, on the AP Calculus exam, is with the candidate's test. And one of the reasons for that is because it's very prescriptive. I know exactly what I need to do. I need to find the critical points. I need to evaluate the function at the critical points and the endpoints of the closed interval. And I simply pick out the maximum and the minimum. And I'm done. You can solve this problem perhaps in a quicker way, or at least another way, by perhaps eliminating some of these. For example, one might be able to right away eliminate zero from discussion. You could add a sentence in here and say, well, look, I don't have to look at zero because, and if Curtis were here, we would ask him why, uh, that would be because it's a local minimum. We could also eliminate perhaps nine from discussion because we know that the function is decreasing down to nine. Now, Tom and I have graded a lot of these exams over the years, and we'll just tell you that I think Tom would back me up on this. It's difficult to make a good, solid argument and get credit for that. And that's another reason why the candidate's test is a good way to proceed. Cool. Let's take a look at part C. Find the intervals on which the graph of G is concave up, and let's find the intervals on which is concave down. Well, how do I do this? The graph of G is going to be concave up wherever G prime is increasing, concave down wherever it's decreasing. So that's not bad at all. Again, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that G prime is equal to F. So I need to take a look at this function and find out, well, where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? It's decreasing from minus 2 to one, minus 1. It's decreasing here from 3 to 9. Those are the two intervals where the graph of G is concave down. Now, you'll also notice here that when I wrote these intervals, I use open intervals there. And again, for me, that goes back to the definition of concavity. A graph can be concave up or concave down at a point, at a value, which is different from increasing and decreasing. And again, we wouldn't take off if a student included the endpoints, again, as long as there's no contradiction. And let's see, where is F increasing? It's increasing from minus one. There it is. It's increasing from minus one up to three. And that's where the graph of G would be concave up. Cool. Usually a problem like that or a question like that on the exam. Let's take a look at part D. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these calculations with you, but you might think about this. This would be a nice question for tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Let's evaluate G for all of these integer values, minus 2, minus 1, 0, all the way up to 9. And we would do this, of course, by making area arguments. And actually, I already did some of this, right? I did it for 0, I think, and minus 2, I think, was it 6 was another one, and 9. And you'd have to do the others, again, making area arguments. And you can probably guess at why I want to do this. I'd like to eventually sketch or get a rough sketch of what the graph of G looks like. So let me put that together if I can in part E. What I'd like to do is to get a rough sketch of the graph of G. And I did that by taking a look at my ordered pairs from the previous part. And I put them all together. And I get this rough sketch of G. And I'm sorry I didn't uh, label this, but this is the graph of G. And this is the graph of F. And you can probably guess at why I do this. In my, in my opinion, this is a nice exercise to discover the fundamental theorem of calculus, to discover exactly what's going on, or this, as Tom calls it, this sort of visual check of what's going on, what's the relationship between G and F. And we see that wherever G is decreasing, F is negative. 
wherever G is increasing, F is positive. And so that gives us some sort of visual clue, visual hint of this fundamental theorem of calculus that you know what, maybe G and F are related by this notion of a derivative. I think that's kind of a neat idea. And that's something that we probably wouldn't have done 50 years ago in calculus class. But I think that's a cool idea. Can I jump in here, Steve, for just a Please. Time? You know, I just wanted to remark that actually sketching that graph that you have here is actually an incredibly powerful way to check your computations in a way. Okay. So, I mean, you actually computed a lot of different area things to get I that didn't. big table of values. Well, let's say that for x equal 4, uh, Steve had miscalculated and actually got something like 12 instead of, I don't know what you got actually, what, eight and a half, something like that. So you got okay. a point up there. Now, if Steve connected those dots up, he would have ended up with a maximum somewhere around 12. And it'd be around four would be the location of it. The thing is, that's not matching up with what the graph of F is telling him. The graph of F is telling him, well, look, there's a change in sign in my derivative at x equals 6. That's where, where it changes from positive. That's where the maximum has to be. So that's tell, that would tell him that one of his calculations was off. So that, that graph, doing that reality check, is that really, is the graph of F really look like the derivative of this graph is a really nice way to check that. And it's a great exercise in, in its own right. Great. And finally, I just want to amplify, you know, Steve said these are common problems on the uh, AP yeah. exam. Man, are they. I would <laughs> say in the last 20 years or so, there has been problems something like this on every single one of those years. It's a graphically presented. It's either uh, presented as a fundamental theorem question or they'll, they'll give you a graph and say, well, this is the derivative of another function mm -hmm. and then ask you about that function so you have to figure out it's a fundamental theorem but this is very popular on the exam yeah correct me if i'm correct me if i'm wrong tom but often we see piecewise linear i'm just going to scribble a little bit on this graph sometimes we get uh, half circles in here or quarter circles and recently we've even had i think uh, piecewise defined functions where we've had some line segments and a part of a parabola are in there if I yeah, remember, there'll be one piece that actually is defined by some formula, but yeah. most of the pieces are graphic. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, that's going to mean that this will be almost always uh, on the non-calculator part of the exam as a really one easy to reason graphically. Cool. All right, let's see if we can take a look at part F here. Let's take a look at some other functions. Uh, that involved this function g, which was defined to be the definite integral from 0 to x of f t dt. So here's an m, which is defined to be g of the square root of x, and I want to see if I can find m prime of 4. Okay, well, let's see. i got to go over here and remind myself, there's the definition of g. So if m is g of the square root of x, there's sort of a more detailed description of this definition of g. It's the definite integral from zero to the square root of x of f of t dt. Well, all right. Let's suppose I want to find now m prime of x. Well, this is really the chain rule, and I might talk a little bit more about this uh, later on symbolically. Uh, but in order to use this, in order to find the derivative here of m, we are using the chain rule. We take the derivative from the outside and work our way in. So what we really need to do is to evaluate f at this argument. So it's f of the square root of x times the derivative of the inner function, which in this case is that upper bound. So that's 1 half x to the minus 1 half. And let's see, I think I did just a little bit of simplifying and wrote it like that. And now if I want to find m prime of 4, I was a little worried about doing this one because I wasn't sure this was going to work out nicely. But m prime of 4 is 1 half f of the square root of 4 over the square root of 4. Well, let's see. 
square root of 4 is 2, so f of 2, I've got to come along here. So my graph has the grid lines in it. I think f of 2 is 5 halves. And I did a little bit of simplification for 5 eighths. Now, there's another interesting question or two involving this function m, and we didn't ask it, but you might think about this. Uh, Allison, you might put this in the chat. Might think a little bit about what is the domain of this new function m? What's the domain of m? Because it looks like we can't let x be a negative number, but maybe there's some other restrictions here. So we'll let people think about that one. Okay, here's g. Here's another function k involved, uh, pardon me, that's defined in terms of g. So k of x is g of x squared. And I want to know, is the graph of k concave up, down, or neither at the point where x equal 2? There's actually a question very similar to this on last year's exam, asking about concavity at a, at a particular value. So it seems to me one way to do this is to take a look at k double prime and evaluate that at x equal 2. And depending upon the sign, we may be able to determine something about concavity. So I'm going to find, first of all, I'm going to find k prime of x. And how do you do that? Well, I've got to use the chain rule. So I start at the outside and I work my way in. So it's g prime of x squared times the derivative of the inner function. And let's see, wait a minute. I know that g prime is f, so that's really just 2x times f of x squared. So there's a little bit of simplification in there. Now, there may be a way to do this, to answer this question by just looking at this and maybe graphing, and that may be something that Tom could take a look at with technology. But I'm going to go further here and find the second derivative of k. And I guess there I've got to use the product rule and the chain rule. So let's see. This would be 2x times the derivative of f of x squared. That's f prime, derivative of the outermost function, times the derivative of the inner one, plus the derivative of the first function times f. And I think from there, all I did was let x be equal to 2. So when I did all that and a little bit of simplification, and oh, by the way, I've got to look at the graph to evaluate f of 4. And I've also got to look at the graph to evaluate f prime of 4. How would I do that? And again, if Curtis were here, we'd ask him. We'd have to take a look at the slope of the graph at 4. Remember that the graph of f was straight line segments. So we'd have to take a look at the slope there. And I think it turns out to be minus 1. I'm going to do all the simplification. And I got a minus 12. So that means that k double prime of 2 is less than 0. And that tells me that k is concave down at the point where x is equal to 2. I put another question in here, maybe something that you could think about. Uh, I kind of enjoy trying to do some of this with technology. I wonder if you could produce the graph, actually produce the graph of k. Given uh, given f, given the graph of f, I wonder if you would be able to do that. That's a nice question for some of your students tomorrow morning. And there's another part here. Holy Toledo, let's take a look at h, and then I'll hand it over to you for a little bit more, Tom. This involves another function, j, defined in terms of g, which is defined in terms of f. And this is a sum of two functions, minus 2x plus g of x. So let's see if we can find the intervals on which the function f is decreasing. Holy Toledo. So just sort of thinking out loud, I think what I need to do is to find the derivative of j. And I think I need to find out where is j less than 0. OK. So I can take the derivative of j term by term. The derivative of minus 2x is minus 2. The derivative of g, well, g prime symbolically. Ah, but wait a minute. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, I know that that's f. So there's the derivative of j. Now, I know that j is going to be decreasing wherever this is true, wherever g, j prime is less than 0. 
So that means wherever this is less than zero, this expression is less than zero. And I'm going to rewrite that a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to use the word simplify, but I'm going to rewrite that so that that would be true, that j prime of x would be less than zero whenever f of x is less than two. So I've added, or I have included the graph of f here. So this is the graph of f. And I'm going to draw in my horizontal line right there at two. And wherever f is less than two, that's where j is decreasing. So that means my intervals are minus two to one and four to nine. I've done that correctly with the intersections. And I've again included the endpoints because, well, by definition, I think you can include those. And I was even able to produce, uh, Tom knows this, I use the TI Inspire a lot, and I also use Mathematica to produce a lot of these graphs. So I was actually able to produce the graph of J. And let's see, does it make sense here? Is it decreasing from minus two to one? Yeah, sure, it looks like it. It's increasing a little bit, and it looks like that's a local max right there. And then it's decreasing again from four to nine. So that's kind of cool. So that sort of, that graph of J backs up my solution here, these intervals in which it's decreasing. Very good. Tom, a little bit more with technology? Sure. Give it a shot. Okay. There you are. Okay. All right, I'll uh, get my screen back up here again. And um, you know, as mentioned before, these graphically presented uh, fundamental theorem of calculus problems are going to generally appear on the non-calculator part of the exam. But as, as you're working on these in class, it can be really handy to, uh, to have a um, digital or graphing calculator version of those problems, especially to do some checks on your work. Uh, so let's take a look. Uh, I actually have in the y equals uh, the function, that piecewise linear function that Steve is working with, already entered. Well, let's take a little bit of time and say, okay, if you wanted to enter a piecewise function, exactly what you, what you do. Now, some of you may be familiar with this already, but I... No, notice that many people, this is uh, sometimes a new thing to them. So I'm going to clear out my Y1 here and show you how to enter a piecewise function. Uh, if we go to the math menu and you scroll down all the way past the integral, you'll get to some B is piecewise. Mm -hmm. So let's enter that. And then it asks us, well, how many pieces do we want? And the default is three, but let's say we just wanted a couple of pieces. I'll say, okay. And notice then it gives you a little template where you can put in the function formulas for each piece, as well as the part of the domain that's gonna be good for. So for example, uh, I'm just doing one for illustration here. Let's say I said, okay, the function is gonna be negative X, for uh, x less than zero. So I'll go to get the less than sign, I'll go to the test menu. That's the second shift of the math menu. Uh, I see that less than sign on our number five. And then let's say my function's equal to just x when x is greater than or equal to zero. And so again, I'll go to the test menu to get a greater than or equal sign four. And if you look at that, what you've done, what you might be noticing, what I've done is bothered to, to define in the piecewise way what we would normally think of as the absolute value function. Okay, so when x is negative, we'll take the opposite of x. And if x is zero or positive, we'll just let x stay the same. And if we um, graph that, uh, yep, it's looking like the absolute value.
and it may take a little while to come up here, but I th think I still have my uh, Y2 <laughs> activated. Uh, so it should be trying to plot an antiderivative of this. And sure enough, it is. Now, the antiderivative, this was defined for all values of x, so we should get a nice smooth curve. Oh, yeah, we are. And if we think about it, this uh, function that we're looking at, it's actually, uh, I think it's negative x squared over 2 for x less than 0 and positive x squared over 2 for x greater than or equal to 0. It looks kind of like a cubic, but sure it's enough. actually two yeah. pieces of quadratics glued together. Okay. All right. Let me go back to the y equals again. Well, let's see. I think it's actually still plotted. So now let's see. Okay. Uh, let me just clear that out. And let me go down to y6. And I'm just pointing out that I went through and took the trouble of analyzing the graph that Steve presented. I mean, each piece was a part of a linear function. So I was able to figure out, okay, what would the formula be? What would be the interval? And this was what I came up with. Uh, you can, so it's, it's negative, the quantity x plus 3 between negative 2 and 1. It was 2x between minus 1 and 1. x plus 3 over 2 between 1 and, uh, let's see, 1 and 3. And then 6 minus x between 3 and 9. And then I graphed it to make sure that worked. So let's just check and see if this actually works. I'm going to turn off uh, y2 right now. And um, for my window, let's see, I think your graph went from like negative three to nine. So I'm gonna change my X min and X max a little bit here. I'm gonna make it negative 3.6 to uh, 9.6. Kind of shift it over by three. And okay. this should give us a decent graph. I don't know if oh, it was you know turned what I on. Think? I don't think I activated it, did I? Yeah. So I need to go down and turn that on. Did you catch something else, Steve, that I might have done? I, I think I, I I didn't think it was turned on. Okay, yeah. There, there we go. go. All right, that's looking pretty good, I think. It's that looks great. Okay. So that's our graph. And the question is, so some strange piecewise linear graph like that, can you still do this fundamental theorem of calculus uh, strategy that we use on the graphing calculator? The answer is, yeah, it definitely will work. So I'm going to go back to y equals. Actually, I'll tell you what, let me go to the mode first and go to classic mode because I want to enter in that uh, accuracy, get it to where we can... Uh, speed it up a little bit. Okay. But for y2, instead of the integral from of y1, let me do the integral of y6. So I'll pull up my y variables, go down to y6, and enter that. And let me also speed up the graphing by putting in a 0 0.1. Okay. So that should give me a pretty decent looking graph. And now um, let's graph again. But I'll tell you what, let me also change my Y range a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me change my Y max to, oh, say 12.3. So I'm just tripling it because I think your graph went up there a ways. Yes, it did. Yeah. Now, when I graph this, because my y2 is the integral, you're going to see the antiderivative graph come up first, and then we'll see the original graph. Now, it's a slightly different window, but let's give it a shot and see what happens. Okay, here comes the antiderivative graph. And by the way, I was saying this was kind of slow, but it was much faster than if I had left <laughs> that, that yeah. value off. So. And so, so theoretically, this, this would look like my smooth curve. 
But I connected exactly. the dots. Yeah, it right. did look very much like the smoother curve you came up with, Steve. Mm -hmm. Making me feel like I should have put in the uh, 0 0.2 or something even faster. So. Uh, it's still pretty good when you think about all the calculations that are going on in the background. Yes, every pixel, it's doing a total definite integral of that weird piecewise function. Yep. So we should see it hitting a maximum at x equals 6. Mm -hmm. And, well, we're getting close to there. It's coming up to x equals 6, I think, if I'm counting the hash marks along the axis. But so it should turn down. I'm just remembering that from your graph. That's where you yep. had your absolute maximum. Yep. And now it's turning Perfect. down. And it'll stop when we get to 9. I think it paused there to catch its breath. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, when it gets to nine, very quickly then you'll see the uh, the original function graph again. Uh, and it'll look a little bit different because of the scaling change that I made. Uh, there we go. There's that. Pretty cool. Oh, very cool. Yes. So, Tom, and, one question about this one. So, uh, sure. what is the definite integral? What's the first graph doing? The red graph, I guess. What is that doing when it plugs in an X that is outside the domain of the orange curve? It returning and saying, I can't do that. It doesn't break it up into two separate integrals or anything like that, clearly, because it's not plotting a point. Well, I'll tell you what, let's let's give it a shot. Let's turn on trace. Okay. Okay, I'm on the antiderivative graph right now. Right. Um, and so something that was outside of the domain would be something like negative three. Yeah, yeah. So let me just put in negative three. Okay. And see what it does. Now, what do you guess it would do? Well, I would, guess, I would guess since there, well, naively, because there is nothing plotted there, I would guess it's going to come back with nothing for Y. Well, let's see what happens. I, I actually not sure. Let's give it a shot. No value for Y. Y is undefined. Because that integral would not make sense for that upper limit of negative three. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, However, you know, uh, another thing we could do, though, is in the y equals, I could, in the fn int, change the upper limit to be uh, the square root of x. Uh-huh. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, really speed this graph up. I'm going to put in like a 0 0.5. Okay. That's, that's going to make it uh, not work nearly as hard. Uh, but let's go ahead and graph this. Oh, now, I notice where this graph is starting. Yeah, we it's get nothing. starting at 0 because it doesn't make sense. If x is negative, square root of x won't make sense. So my domain starts at x equals zero. And I think you actually asked, uh, I'm not sure, I think Allison said nobody answered that question, what's the domain? Let's see, well, how big x, how big could x be for the square root of x to make sense as an upper limit on that definite integral? Hmm. Well, I'm thinking it could be a little bit bigger than nine. <laughs> let's see. I think as long as the square root ended up being nine or less, we'd be good. Yeah. So I think X could be as big as 81. I agree. <laughs> now, this stopped graphing when it got to the edge of the screen. But right. that's, that's a graph of, I think, your function M. So. Yep. How about that? But, you know, one then could turn around and take derivatives of these definite integral functions, all kinds of stuff. It's really quite cool. So it's very powerful. 
Uh, but uh, I think we're getting close to in the time. So let me stop my share and turn it back okay. to you to wind things up. Oops. Okay. I'll do uh, one more problem, Allison, if it's okay with you, and we'll call it a night. I'm going to share my screen once more. And I just wanted to remind you of these types of functions, uh, these types of problems. Uh, we often see these on the multiple choice portion of the exam. This is also an application of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, but it's also an application of the chain rule. Um, here's kind of a quick way that I think about this. Here's what's really going on in the background, although I think when most of us solve these problems, we do them rather quickly without writing all of this out, and that's fine. So if we want the derivative of a function like f to find this way, where the upper bound is not a single variable, we have to think of that upper bound as a function, as an inner function. And so the derivative of this function f with respect to x is really the derivative of f with respect to u times du dx, where u is really equal to the square root of x here. And so when we do that, the derivative of f with respect to u, well, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is the chain rule. And this is how it works out in this particular problem. It simplifies kind of neatly to this one. And so what we did in these problems, if I can just look at these kind of quickly, is we gave you several possibilities here. In this problem, the upper bound is a constant and the lower bound is a function. How do you handle that one? Using the chain rule, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, and using some properties of definite integrals. In this problem, uh, we have a definite integral function, or a function defined as a definite integral, where both the upper and the lower bounds are functions of x. And it, again, I want to wish Curtis were here. I wanted to ask him about this. You know, what most of us know, students, you know this too, that to solve this kind of a problem, to find the derivative, we're actually going to have to break this definite integral up into two parts. And often we say break it up at zero because, well, you know, that zero is usually an easy value for x. I didn't do that here. I broke it up at minus one. And I'm just going to write off to the side y minus one. And you might think about that. Why did he use minus one? Why did he use zero? Why did he pick that value? This is kind of a complicated answer, uh, but nevertheless, a good problem. In three, uh, we remember we will post these answers, these solutions, or Curtis will post these sometime tomorrow. This is kind of a neat problem, too, where g is defined, again, as a definite integral, but we want to find out where is g concave down and eventually sketch the graph of g. That's a nice problem, a little bit different. And in part four, we just had some examples of using the fundamental theorem of calculus, part two. As Tom talked about when we started the session this evening, that's the part that we all remember 50 years ago. Boy, it made finding these antiderivatives a little bit easier. We didn't have to go back to the definition and use a, a remind sum and take a limit. So we had a couple of those in here in A, B, C, and D. And I even had a calculator example. And there's even an overtime problem in here. Well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, we enjoy this fundamental theorem of calculus topic. That's one of our favorites. We do have some dates picked out for the spring and some tentative topics, which Curtis will be posting very soon. Um, Allison, I think that does it. Thank you very much.